Welcome to IP Goes Pop, your source for exploring the interface between intellectual property and pop culture. The IP Goes Pop podcast series is created and produced by Volpe Koenig, an intellectual property law firm based in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Visit us at vklaw.com. This program should not be considered legal advice. Please consult an attorney for your specific situation. Greetings to everyone. Greetings to new listeners. And welcome to IP Goes Pop. I'm your host of IP Goes Pop, Michael Snyder. I'm an intellectual property lawyer from the law firm Volpe Koenig in Philadelphia. And each week, we will explore popular culture with an intellectual property spin. This week, IP Goes Pop watches TV, most specifically a very exciting and timely topic, Tiger King. Subtitle, Murder, Mayhem, and Madness. We will not be delving into the murder, mayhem, and madness. We will be sticking with the intellectual property aspects of this pop culture phenomenon. And it really is a phenomenon. It is a, an extremely popular Netflix documentary series. Everyone is talking about it. We are not being sponsored by Netflix, but certainly to, to have this episode make more sense, you may wish to, to check out the documentary. It, it is worth your time, I believe. It is about one... Joseph Allen Maldonado hyphen passage. That's just one of his many names. His other name is Joseph Schreibvogel. But the name that he is known for in popular culture is Joe Exotic for his work with exotic animals at the Greater Wynwood Exotic Animal Park or the GW Zoo, as it is known in Wynwood, Oklahoma. There is a what I think is fair to say a, a fairly interesting and wild cast of characters that work at the zoo, which houses hundreds of tigers. There are lions, uh, there are apes, there are monkeys, um, lemurs, alligators. But for our purpose, we'll, we'll focus on some of the IP aspects. And really underlying the entire documentary series is this epic struggle between Joe Exotic and his arch rival and nemesis, Carol Baskin of Big Cat Rescue. Carol Baskin and her husband are involved with protecting tigers and other big cats through their Big Cat Rescue program. They have accused Joe Exotic of many things, one of those things being that they do not like the tiger petting trade. So, in an all out effort to shut down Joe Exotic, they they ultimately relied upon using the power of intellectual property, most specifically the power of trademarks, which we'll get into in a moment. So we're going to skip the well-traveled discussion of intrigue and innuendo and focus on the intellectual property issues that eventually led to Joe Exotic losing the GW Zoo. So let's talk about trademarks. And before we crawl into the tiger cage, we need an understanding of what that means. So that's where John O'Malley of Volpe Koenig will come in. John, if you could just start with the basics of what is a trademark and what does it protect? Sure. Um, a trademark is any symbol, um, sound, word, name, that or color that distinguishes uh, one party's goods and services from those manufactured or sold by others. And the primary purpose is to indicate the source of the goods or the services. Um, that means a company can reg register a trademark with the federal government. Um, we call it the United States Patent Trademark Office or the USPTO for its business name, its slogans, logos, or other items that essentially form the brand of that product or that company. So one of the concepts with trademarks is the goodwill associated with the trademark. Can can you tell the listeners a little bit, what, is, what does it mean to have goodwill? What does it mean to feel goodwill for a trademark or a brand when you see it? Sure. I guess, I mean, the best way probably to analogize it would be that it's goodwill is somewhat comparable to the, the reputation. So if there's a strong goodwill, um, for example, Apple has a strong goodwill for its iPhones. Um, people when they think of Apple, they think of a certain quality, a certain level of uh, sophistication, a certain level of uh, panache or, or, or status. 
Um, but it can also mean for, uh, for a nonprofit, it could be its good name as being a quality nonprofit or a place that you can feel comfortable donating your money or your goods or services. So it's, it's very important. And it's the main reason trademarks exi exist is to protect the goodwill that is developed through using the, the trademark over time. So when I'm walking through, let's say the supermarket, I'm, I'm in the cereal aisle and I, I see rows and rows of cereal. If I am drawn to one of those brands of cereal based on my grandparents always bought it and my parents always used it. And I already, I always had it for breakfast every morning. Is that part of that feeling of goodwill associated with that brand? Exactly. Um, it's the expectation that you're going to have in terms of quality. If you see that trademark, you know that your cornflakes are going to have a certain flavor or taste or um, consistency that you like. And you know, if you see that trademark, you're going to um, obtain what you're buying the product for. And if someone's allowed to kind of steal your goodwill, they can trade off of your reputation, confuse consumers so that the consumer is actually buying a product that they don't really want. So if that's what a trademark is, then how do you, how do you protect a trademark? So people might not understand, do you have to register it, for example, with the United States Patent and Trademark? How do I start to build up rights? Let's say I think of a fantastic name or my marketing group thinks of a name. What do I have to do to make sure someone else doesn't take my trademark? Well, the, probably the best thing you could do is to file a, a federal trademark registration because that gives you constructive rights throughout the entire United States, which means you don't have to establish that you're using a trademark in the geographic area. Um, the alternative to that is you can rely on common law rights, which means that you can gain trademark rights merely by using uh, the trademark in commerce. The downside of common law rights is you only gain trademark rights in the area where the geographic area where you use the trademark. And actually, in the Joe Exotic case, both common law and federal trademark registration rights were, were used by, uh, by Big Cat Rescue. Perfect segue. So l let's get into it. So let's assume that the battle was raging between Joe Exotic and Carol Baskin, Big Cat Rescue positioning themselves as protectors of tigers, Joe Exotic being painted as someone who exploits perhaps the animals. Again, these are all allegations. We're, we're not making any judgments. We're just looking at it from the intellectual property perspective. So let's talk about, uh, there were multiple lawsuits by Big Cat Rescue against the GW Zoo and against Joe Exotic personally. But what really took him down, of, of all things, you know, reptiles, exotic animals, tiger petting, of all the things that were going on at the GW Zoo, the final thing that began his demise as an operator of a zoo was, in fact, a trademark issue. So if you could, John, tell us a little bit about the trademark complaint. Yeah, and I have to say that was very clever by uh, Carol Baskin and Big Cat Rescue to use their IP um, to, to attack or to bring down Joe Exotic, who was presenting, um, if you've watched the show, a lot of issues for Big Cat Rescue. Um, it started, and this is up from watching the, the show. I actually watched it twice, once with my wife and once with my son, just to see his reaction to the program. So I think perhaps one more time should do it. I think so, just to make sure I don't miss any uh, key points. Um, but from, from what I gathered, um, during the winter months when – customers weren't coming to the GW Zoo, Joe Exotic would take the animals on the road to malls um, and other public venues. And, you know, the tigers, the baby tigers were very popular. And apparently he generated significant revenue from that. And then Big Cat Rescue um, learned of that and started a program of writing to these malls, complaining about um, the treatment of the animals. And apparently um, that is one of the things that uh, it hurt Joe Exotic's business because he was losing malls um, who didn't want the bad publicity associated with uh, allegedly harming animals. So when he learned what was happening, he um, 
I think it was part of his revenge a little bit, but he changed the name of his traveling show to Big Cat Rescue Entertainment, which is by itself, you wouldn't say, well, that's what's the problem with that? Um, the problem is uh, Big Cat Rescue had a federal trademark registration for the trademark, uh, a Big Cat Rescue with the symbol of a, a large cat. It was kind of its logo. So basically they obtained a trademark registration for their logo. And then Joe Exotic continued to have some fun with uh, Carol Baskin and Big Cat Rescue and kind of copied the look and feel a little bit of their website on some of his uh, branding materials. Um, and in fact, he uh, publicly stated that he was doing this activity to kind of harm the goodwill, which we talked about earlier, of Big Cat Rescue. All right. Now, let me let me step in for a second and and let's deconstruct this, because there is a lot, as with almost anything that happens with Joe Exotic, there is a lot going on just in what you said. So let's start with the first test. So the Big Cat Rescue trademark is Big Cat Rescue. He began using Big Cat Rescue Entertainment. So he essentially added a single word to Big Cat Rescue. Now, let's say that someone wants to come very close without stepping over some line. What is the line in trademark law? What What is the test for when one trademark infringes another trademark? The test is uh, commonly called likelihood of confusion. So the test is whether a consumer seeing the trademark would likely to be confused. And there's a lot of different factors that you look at, but the two most important are how similar the trademarks are and how similar the respective goods and services of the parties are. Okay. And some, and just to, for our listeners who aren't familiar with likelihood of confusion, some of the other factors are where the goods are sold, how they travel, who's the target customers are, are these very expensive goods? Are they impulse item type of buys? So there, there is a lot that goes into the test of likelihood of confusion. But as you said, here we have an issue with perhaps the two most important of the likelihood of confusion factors. Can you imagine a situation where taking your competitor's trademark and adding a word would not be trademark infringement? Would that ever work? And do you believe that Joe received and followed any legal advice in adopting that mark? No, because another factor that's used in, in deciding likely to confusion is intent. And Joe Exotic clearly laid out, made it public why he was doing what he was doing. Um, he intended to trade off of the goodwill of Big Cat Rescue. Uh, and if he could, he was hoping he would damage the goodwill of Big Cat Rescue. So in a, in a legal situation, um, those are pretty bad facts. I'm certain that he didn't have trademark counsel advising him about using uh, Big Cat Rescue Entertainment. And remember, this is before the IP Goes Pop podcast, so he also didn't have access to this as well. Or, you know, our upcoming Twitter uh, launch. So um, Joe Exotic was pretty savvy social media wise, so I'm sure he would have learned of us eventually. So I have a question. Now, one thing we're going to do on IP Goes Pop is address some of the urban legends out there about patents, trademarks, and copyrights. For trademarks, is there any type of magic formula uh, as far as how close is too close or how close you could come to an existing trademark? Is there any formula that someone could use almost mathematically to try to figure out if they would infringe another person's trademark? No, there's no objective standard, but I can tell you, um, and this, I mean, we deal with clients ask this question a lot when their, their mark is very close or, or even identical to another mark, they'll say, well, what, you know, can I just add a word before or after? Um, and unfortunately for, for them, um, you can't just add a word after a trademark, especially a word like entertainment, which is descriptive or generic that doesn't change the analysis. Uh, because when it's descriptive or generic, that word is almost kind of read out of the trademark. So you still look at the main uh, terms, the dominant portions of the trademark. So there is no kind of secret way to try to get around a trademark, especially when you're using the exact same terms and then just adding a term. 
one thing you just mentioned leads me into the next area of inquiry, and that is, let's say, and I'll, I'll give you an, a hypothetical here, which I know lawyers love. Let's say that Joe Exotic, before taking any of his action, came in to you for advice, and Joe Exotic said, I, I have an arch enemy, Carol Baskin. She's trying to shut me down. Uh, I want to keep going with my, uh, in this case, tiger petting promotions or something else. I'm interested in also using a trademark like Big Cat or Big Cat Rescue or Cat Rescue or some combination. What What is your advice? What could we do? Um, should I just pick a different mark? What What is the type of advice that he might have heard? Well, I probably, um, if, if Joe came in, to the office, um, I would be thrilled, but I would also, <laughs> I would advise him again against choosing big cat rescue. I should point out that the, in the registration for big cat rescue, they did disclaim the terms big cat rescue, which a disclaimer is when, um, someone who's using or registering a trademark disclaims the right to exclusive right to use, say the, the phrase big cat rescue, because, the Patent and Trademark Office considers that phrase to be uh, descriptive or uh, descriptive of the trademark, which means it should be available to other people to use because there are, you know, big cats is a, is a way to describe tigers and lions. And so in some ways, the advice to Joe would have been start with is I would strongly advise him against going after and using the big cat rescue trademark. Um, if he was going to use the Big Cat Rescue trademark, I would advise him to perhaps use it to refer to Big Cat Rescue if you wanted to distinguish himself or his company from that. And perhaps even add a disclaimer that there's no association between Big Cat Rescue and whatever name Joe Exotic was going to use for his company. All right. So very, very, very different course of action than what he actually did, which was copy the exact mark and add one word to it. Yes. And then, yes. <laughs> All right. And then he compounded that by basically taking the look and feel from Big Cat Rescue's website at the time and then using that um, on his trucks. And there's some other factors that show how he was trying to trade off of the goodwill of Big Cat Rescue, he set up uh, the business address in Florida where Big Cat Rescue is located and used a Florida telephone number, which is also um, where Big Cat Rescue was located, which is in comparison to where uh, the GW Zoo was, which was in Oklahoma. So at this point, you have a situation where for years this battle raged between these arch enemies and this blood feud, and yet this trademark infringement lawsuit ultimately is, as I said before, what brought down Joe Exotic and perhaps leveraged a situation where he had to give up some rights in the GW Zoo. How successful, first of all, how, how expensive do you think it was perhaps for, the, for Big Cat Rescue and the Baskins to bring this lawsuit? And then how successful was it and what did they get at the end of the day? Well, in terms of attorney's fees, um, that's the only thing we can go by. But the case, basically, Joe Exotic settled the case by entering into a consent judgment. And there, just to give a little background, there was also two other cases, IP cases, that Big Cat Rescue brought. And those other two cases had to do with copyright infringement. Um, but they um, they were more limited in nature because of the, the copyright infringement uh, was only three or four photos. Um, so the, the, the potential damages was much less. Just to give some background on the copyright infringement part of the lawsuit, Joe Exotic also ran his own web TV series on YouTube and perhaps did some streaming, but I believe it was mostly on YouTube. In the back of his transmission, there were images taken from the Big Cat Rescue website and their promotional materials using that material. And we are going to have a separate IP Goes Pop podcast on copyright infringement. So we'll probably revisit that. But I did 
want to give some of the background of the copyright part. But John, please continue with the manner of success and and how well did Big Cat Rescue succeed in this lawsuit? Um, yeah, so uh, the, the lawsuit went on for about two, approximately two years, from what I can tell from the records. And during that time, they incurred Big Cat Rescue incurred about uh, six hundred and fifty thousand dollars in attorneys' fees, um, which I would assume that. Joe Exotic probably incurred, you know, maybe 75% or 100%. It's hard to know. But um, so he probably incurred similar expenses within a range. And Joe Exotic actually brought a motion for summary judgment in that case on the grounds that Big Cat Rescue and Carol Baskin were uh, slandering him and libeling him. He lost on summary judgment. And then shortly thereafter, uh, the case settled. And based on my experience, when that happens, um, it usually means that Joe Exotic ran out of money and Big Cat Rescue was able to use its trademarks. Um, and it's important to note, they also relied on their common law trademarks in the, they had a, a separate kind of Big Cat logo that they used, which I mentioned, which they used on uh, their website, which Joe Exotic put on uh, his buses and his his promotional material. So the, the combined trademarks, common law and federal registrations allowed Big Cat Rescue to force Joe Exotic to settle the case for a very su- substantial sum of money. If you include the attorney's fees and compensatory damages, I believe it was about $953,000. So we're talking about a million dollars in leverage. And I know for those of you who are fans of the show, Tiger King, they began to seize property to pay for the award of damages in that particular case. And it really goes to show you that, again, John, you had mentioned how clever they were to come up with. They probably looked at points of pressure for years to try to make something happen. And uh, if we ever need proof of the potency and the power of intellectual property and particularly trademarks, this is the case that would tell that story. Now, before we sum up, essentially, one thing that happens, as you know, in popular culture, how quickly things can spread, you know, spreading virally, if you will, because of Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and all of the social media platforms There are already some copycat companies, if you will, who have tried to capitalize on the fame and the popularity of the Joe Exotic phenomenon. Have you seen anything in the trademark world where people are trying to jump on the Joe Exotic train, if you will? Yes. And you see this happen with, uh, as Mike mentioned, in any type of popular culture. Uh, when something uh, hits uh, the, the fancy of the public, there's almost like a gold rush to the trademark office to try to obtain trademarks on the, the key terms that are everyone's talking about. So I, I looked uh, this afternoon before we started the podcast, and there are currently six pending trademark applications for Tiger King. And there's also pending applications for Joe Exotic. The Tiger King, three of those applications were filed to cover, among other things, clothing by three different individuals and companies. And then the other uh, trademark applications, one covered Halloween costumes by a totally different party. And then there was uh, some other companies or individuals filed for trademark applications covering a wide variety of goods and services And interestingly, all of these trademark applications were filed the first week of April, which is when, I guess, kind of Joe Exotic really hit the the, the public imagination. No, that's when Joe Exotic dropped, or at least the announcement that it would be on. I I guess a lesson here is if you perceive or have a, a feeling that something you're doing might be popular enough where you're going to want to sell T-shirts or other kind of merchandise... Your best bet is to file first. Your best bet is to get in line at the trademark office before anyone else, correct? Correct. And if, I mean, if you are going to try that route, um, 
it's it's not as easy as it sounds. Um, you do have to have a bona fide intention to use the trademark if you're going to file on an intent to use basis, which which all of these applications, which I mentioned, did. And that means you have to be planning to use the trademark in good faith. And if you're ever contested, you have to be able to establish kind of written evidence of your planning or actions to use the trademark, which in my experience, most of these uh, kind of gold rush companies don't actually have. Um, and then in some situations, the patent and trademark office is aware of these popular culture and they do examine them uh, very closely in, in view of potential likelihood of confusion. So for example, if Joe Exotic, theoretically, he was known as the Tiger King by, I think he's self-named himself that um but i i think it's not an official title i'm i did not do the research but i'm fairly sure tiger king is not an official title and he is not actual royalty i think queen elizabeth may differ on that but um i'll, I'll let you <laughs> so um yes it, there's definitely a gold rush and it's essentially with trademarks in a situation like this it could be first to file unless someone had been using the trademarks so um, the people who filed first are definitely have the advantage and may be able to take advantage of the situation or profit from it. All right. So there's been a lot of information about trademarks woven into this tale, this battle that raged for many years. And it turned out that perhaps the only thing that could have stopped Joe Exotic, because many people had tried was intellectual property. Uh, so the lessons here are protect your intellectual property, protect it early, uh, file for trademarks with the United States Patent and Trademark Office because they can be incredibly valuable. Don't copy your arch enemy's trademark as closely as possible. And I would also say perhaps be wary of anyone who owns more than 10 or 20 tigers. I think that would be the limit for a a uh, for trusting someone with tigers. So this is Michael Snyder with John O'Malley from Volpe Koenig on IP Goes Pop and we look forward to seeing you in popular culture talking about intellectual property. Thank you. The IP Goes Pop podcast series is created and produced by Volpe Koenig, an intellectual property law firm based in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Visit us at vklaw.com.